next guest will tell us about networking architecture of Warframe. Please welcome Maciej Siniwo. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Maciej Siniwo. I'm a programmer at Digital Extremes, and today I will be talking a little bit about uh, networking solutions for Warframe. Uh, a quick outline of, of the talk. I will give a, a short overview of our replication system so that uh, we're all on the same page. Uh, study a case of a bolt throw in one of our game modes. Uh, we'll discuss the optimization that we've done for the replication so that it takes as little time as possible, mostly by offloading uh, work to the background thread. Uh, we'll describe our congestion control system and talk a little bit about uh, our de de dedicated server technology. So before we start, I'd like to reference uh, a few other talks that should be interesting for everyone that, that's uh, interested in networking. The first one is for, by uh, Dave Aldrich from Bungie. And it's been a big inspiration both for some of the systems I implemented here and also uh, for this talk in particular. And as I was working on that presentation, these two other ones came out from the Blizzard guys at GDC 2017. And they made my life uh, much easier because apparently we do many things in a similar way. So we'll focus on elements that we do differently. And if it's something that's been covered in details in any of these, I'll just direct you to the source. Uh, so a little bit about Warframe. This slide I pretty much recycled from last year. I had to change the, the number of, of accounts. We're at over 32 million now. And the last point is new as well. We're still mostly peer-to-peer, -peer, but in October 2016, we added support uh, for uh, what we call volunteer PvP servers. So our players can basically host their own dedicated servers. Uh, if you follow the, 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 the link, it will actually point you to the current leaderboard. So, so you can see they do a decent job, a very good job actually. Uh, the, the current leader has over uh, has almost 50,000 sessions hosted. And yeah, the, the pink Excalibur in the background is actually my daughter's character. She can't play Warframe, but she hangs around in the arsenal. Uh, so these are layers, uh, the high level overview of layers that, that typically build a, a game networking system. Or to be more specific, this is, this is a Warframe version. And you could probably talk, uh, have it like a full-blown talk about any of these, uh, but today we'll mostly focus on replication and a little bit of congestion control. In our case, congestion control sits in between uh, replication and, and transport, uh, because we found that replication gives it much more information. So a little bit of history, a short taxonomy of replication models in games, and if you're interested in details, uh, go and see Philip Orwick's talks, because it has much more information, I will just uh, try to be super brief here. So we have a deterministic lockstep, uh, in which case clients, they basically only send their input to the host, host propagates it to all the other clients, and once everyone has the same input, they run the same simulation code, and hopefully arrive to the same results. So in this approach, you basically trade warring for bandwidth, because input is small and uh, you can compress it really nicely. Uh, for worrying about determinism and, and desynchronizations. It's mostly used for RTS games, although apparently recently the, the For Honor used uh, an approach that's somewhat similar to this one. Then we have a snapshot interpolation, which people sometimes call a quake model. It's been used uh, for like most of the old FPS games, and in this model, basically server sends the whole uh, word state to all clients. So they all get the same information. It's super fast. You don't have to pick and choose what do you want to serialize. You just dump state of your objects to the stream and send it over. <coughs> but as the, the games get more complex and you have like thousands of objects in a world, uh, it became problematic from a bandwidth standpoint. So uh, another approach is stage replication. That's what <coughs> Warframe uses and many other modern games. And in this case, we basically, every client gets their own individual uh, packets of information. So it's, it's possible that two clients playing on the same host will basically get a completely disjoint set of information if they're in a different places on a map. So just to make sure this is clear, this is how it might look with host and two clients. And you can, it's mostly so that you can see uh, they, not only they get different objects, the, all, like the order is different for one thing because probably the, the client I cares more about Excalibur, but also they basically get different uh, objects in their packets. The green dots are properties of this object. I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment. And then we have also events for stuff like, you know, game has started or finished. 
uh, that are not uh, typically uh, a state messages. So what's a network property? I will usually just say property for short, but in the context of this talk, I, I mean network property. It's a network relevant data field of a replicated object. And a network relevant bit is, is actually important because object can have hundreds of properties, but not all of them are, are important from a network standpoint. Like a position of a dynamic object is usually uh, network relevant. However, if you have, a, for example, a mesh representation and uh, it never changes, host and client, so they, they load it on their end and it's, there's no need to, to, to send it over the network. So in this case, mesh wouldn't be a, a network property. And you can implement it in a whole bunch of different ways. Back in the day, uh, many games would try to, to just create a, a small number of groups and those properties would share a group. So if any of them change, they would all go together. And maybe we had like up to whatever, 32 groups per object. So it, your dirty mask uh, record was basically a single word. And then the other extreme would be just to have a whole bunch of individual properties with individual dirty bits, which is a little bit more expensive to, to manage. Uh, and in our version, we basically, we avoided the problem and just let the gameplay guys decide. And we provide them with, with, with a simple wrapper, uh, like a template that's basically a wrapper over a row value and a dirty bit. And then if they decide a group of properties should change together, they, uh, they can just encapsulate in a struct and have a tenet of that struct. Color, I guess, is a good example. You rarely want to differentiate between RGB. You just send a whole color across. Position is a little bit more tricky depending on your game. If you don't really jump that often, maybe it makes sense to separate like the horizontal plane coordinates and the vertical axis. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's up to them. Uh, and it, just a word of caution, it's tempting to have uh, support for dynamic arrays of replicated uh, properties, and it's, it, it is convenient for sure. It's just, it adds a whole another layer of complexity. Because without it, it's all completely static, right? The size of your dirty bit uh, for, for a, any given object, a dirty bit record for any given object is always the same. The offset for properties is always the same, so it's trivial to do all the operations between <coughs> on a bit record from different points in time. Once you, once this assumption is violated, then uh, what used to be a simple bit record now uh, needs to store this whole information about underlying structure. So nice to have, but at a later point in development, I probably like 80 to 90% of weird edge cases I had to fix had something to do with dynamic arrays. So buyers beware. Properties can have priorities. In our case, they translate almost directly to replication frequency. And there's few distinct uh, levels, basically. We have high priority properties like position and health. We have mid priority properties. And then we have low priority properties that are mostly cosmetic stuff. And there's no point in talking about like the exact numbers because it's all data driven. Uh, but it only applies in a perfect conditions if you can actually afford to send it all at like the, the source frequency, let's say, right? If you're throttled, you basically cannot uh, send as much data as we need you to. You only have like half of the available bandwidth and everything is scaled down as what used to be sent at 30 times per second now would be only sent at, at 15 if you only can send half, right? We, on, we don't go lower than half because the assumption is like we can only throttle you so much and you still cannot keep up. Uh, there's not really that much that we can do. Although there is one other element of, of, of uh, how you can limit your bandwidth and that's object prioritization. Again, this only kicks in uh, if you cannot keep up. If, if you have enough bandwidth, you just send all the objects and uh, all the properties for these objects and that's it. But if you don't, it's important that uh, the more important, at least the, the, the more important object get there, right? So we sort for every client, every object, we calculate their priorities. We sort for every client, we sort the objects by their perceived importance and then we start replicating once we discover there's no more available bandwidth, we just stopped and the next frame will try again. And the priority for the objects that didn't get through will actually be preserved. So even if you're not super important, but you have not been replicated in a very long time, you will eventually bubble up to the top, hopefully. 
And when it's done, it's like for 95% of types, it's basically just one number that's set per type somewhere by, by designers. <coughs> but we have a custom code uh, logic for few types, mostly avatars, right? Because the, the avatar you control is obviously super important. Our players are fairly important. Avatars that are nearby are important. Avatars you fight with are important. Avatars that you have just killed are very important. You don't want to wait uh, half a second for a guy to ragdoll. Uh, so that's all covered in code, but it only affects few types. So that's a replication flow for a single object uh, with two clients. That's how it might look like in the end. So we have this, this dirty mask for, 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 for the master object. These are basically all the properties that have changed in this frame that we combine for each client uh, with outstanding properties. These are properties that for some reason didn't go out in a previous frame, probably because it wasn't their time. This is the replication frequency thing. And then we just do a serialization based on this, this <coughs> final uh, there to be record for each client. So green blocks will be transmitted. Red ones are skipped because they are not dirty. And then the, the yellowish one is suppressed, which again means basically it's not time yet for this priority to go out. And then bits corresponding to properties that were suppressed will be set. <laughs> And the, the next frame will try again. They will basically be the, the previous frame bit records now. Oh, and also we maintain like a lifetime uh, mask uh, for every master object so that if someone joins in progress, he will basically get all the properties that have changed uh, until this point. So as you can see, it's not super expensive in terms of like heavy calculations going on. It's just a few, you know, uh, bit mask operations. Uh, but serialization moves some memory around, and memory access is still one of the things that's, you know, uh, not so fast even on modern computers. So ideally, we wouldn't do it for all the objects, especially if they don't change, because we really have thousands. This is not like exaggeration. We do have thousands of objects uh, to update, and the old Pareto rule uh, kicks in again, and basically for any given frame, there's maybe like uh, five to ten percent of objects that change in this frame, and the rest just sits there. So it would be nice if you could differentiate between objects that change frequently, like avatars or weapons, and objects that don't, like elevators or doors, which basically they sit there, they wait for their 15 seconds of, seconds of fame, they do their thing, and then they go back to sleep. And to add a wrinkle, it would be nice to make it automatic, right? Without having some poor soul actually sit there and categorize this object, because that would obviously break sooner or later. So that's what we did. We have two lists, basically high frequency, low frequency list. High frequency list will be always processed uh, every frame, low frequency, only a small chunk. And then next frame, we just pick up where we left, like round robin style. And then we move objects between this list. Basically, if you're on a high frequency list and you haven't been dirty for enough time, you go to the low frequency list. If you're on the low frequency list and you are dirty, you go back to the high frequency. And these timers, uh, how long can you stay unchanged, is basically uh, per object. And it's being modified as well. So if every time the object is dirty, we bump it a little bit. Uh, so objects that are dirty <laughs> frequently, uh, they will uh, they're given more slack. And then every time we move the object, we bump it quite a bit because we, we'd like to avoid ping-ponging between those two lists. The idea is basically if you have to move the object back and forth, let it sit on the high-frequency list, and that, that's easier this way. And that actually works surprisingly well. This is something I implemented uh, for Darkness 2, so the previous game. And I pretty much didn't have to touch it for the past few years except to tweak some numbers. It converges fairly quickly after the like initial warm up. We we're down, left with like 120, 150 objects on the high frequency list, uh, and it has a nice, unexpected benefit of of you can inspect those two lists, and sometimes you see that oh, uh, what is this guy doing on the high frequency list? He shouldn't change that that often. <coughs> so switching gears now. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, case of throwing a ball in, in one of our PvP game modes, Lunaro, which is basically, you can think of it as a, a futuristic handball 
slash rugby slash speedball if you've played speedball back in the day. So basically, you run around with a ball, you pass it to your teammates, you score by throwing a ball through through a ring, and the ball has a timer, so it can explode after a while, and it makes you to drop it, right? So the problem here is how to specifically about throwing a ball, how to hide the latency be, uh, when a client tries to <coughs> uh, initiate this action, tell the host that we, you need to place the animation, play the animation, and then at some point the ball should detach from his hand and, and fly. And one solution that we can immediately discard, and like it's, it's really a, a, a not a real solution, will be to make it completely host authoritative, right? So you basically ask for permission every step of the way. So you press the, the action button, you ask the host, hey, can I, can I throw a ball, and then wait for the host to tell you if you can, because then you sit there doing nothing, and players just hate that for a good reason, right? You, you need an immediate response. Something has to happen as soon as you press the button. So it's very, it's very similar to, to a grenade throw, uh, in a way, right? So I, I borrowed, borrowed this, this, this uh, uh, sequence diagram from Dave Aldridge's talk, pretty much. This is how Halo does grenade throw, and how many games, mostly first person, do grenade throw. It's, it's a nice way to visualize a uh, message flow in a multiplayer game, right? The vertical line here is, is time, and then the diag diagonal arrows are, are messages going through. So in this case, we predict the throw animation. We press the action button, the throw animation begins on a client. We start playing, we tell the host, hey, play the throw animation on your end. Throw animation begins on a host. And we eventually reach the release event, and at this point, the ball should just detach and, and fly. So we tell the host, hey, create a ball for me. And then after another round trip time, the ball actually starts doing its thing on, on the client's end. And uh, there's a some lag between the release event and, and the moment where the ball actually leaves your hand on the client side. <coughs> but many games get away with this, especially with a first-person game, because the animation doesn't end here, right? It continues. So for another, depending on the animation, some milliseconds, you have a giant hand uh, covering 90% of your screen. So apparently, you can get away with you know, uh, 50, 100, even uh, yeah, 100 milliseconds, 150 up to 200 with, uh, for casual players. Uh, the problem is Warframe is a third-person game. So when we tried it, it looks somehow like this. So you, know, it, you can tell it kind of, this is with 200 millisecond lag, 20 millisecond jitter. I'll play it a few more times, but you can tell something's off. If you analyze it frame by frame, then it's really obvious. Uh, but even here, you can, it's not like, you know, maybe, maybe you, you, you can't expect. Miracles, this is a 200 millisecond lag, but doesn't really look that great. So what else can be done? We can have a go all the way, right? Have a full prediction. Uh, in this case, it starts the same way. The difference is once you re reach the release event, you actually start simulating the ball on your end. And you, only tell, you don't ask the host for permission, you just tell him, hey, I've thrown a ball. Handle it on your side. And then the host gets back to you, and there's this reconciliation stage, which I made intentionally hand wavy because it really depends what you do here. It's you have a whole variety of options, and that depends on your limitations and what you want to achieve. Like if you want the host to be still authoritative over the ball in the air, you have to do something at this point because you get your ball uh, that's simulated by the client, and you, then you get information about the ball from the host. And the positions are usually the, the both. Uh, the information from the host is basically in the past, right? So get some weird warping. You can do all kinds of fakes, right? If you have, if you run your own physics, uh, you have more freedom there because maybe you can run the client simulation a little bit slower, so the host gets a chance to catch up. What people sometimes do is on a host, the ball will actually spawn a little bit ahead. So again, it will it will uh, catch up easier, but it has problems with what if it collides in this time window. In the end, you kind of, it's, you, you're cheating here, right? Because you, you, there's no lag at all, and you're trying to cover that, that fact. You can still do it for some cases. Like, I think Rocket League does that pretty much. They only correct if you're way off, but they don't, there's no, it's not a, technically a ball throw. It just, it, it bounces around. Uh, 
So we kind of always, with full prediction, the question that you need to ask is basically, what's my worst case of misprediction? And sadly, in our case, the worst uh, case was quite terrible, and this is the client, he can never be sure if he actually has a ball when he throws it, because maybe uh, he didn't get the information yet that he's been tackled or the ball exploded and he dropped it. So we were getting a cases where two clients would throw a ball on their end, and they were both right in their own reality, but the server had to take the decision which one really is right, right? Uh, so that led to really bad cases when on your, if you do like the full simulation on your screen, maybe you even scored, scored a point and then uh, eventually get a correction from the host. Not only you didn't score, the ball is now in a completely different place because someone else had it. So I wish we'd maybe try to explore it a little bit more, uh, but it was giving us just too many problems, even locally. And if you, if you get those kind of problems locally, uh, you, it's it's very much uh, guaranteed you will get even worse problems on public. We still use full prediction for some of our other projectiles, like we have Glaive, which is basically kind of a boomerang projectile, but this one you own, right? There's no way you don't have it or someone grabbed it or uh, it, it just belongs to you. So this one is fully predicted and then we only correct it if it's way off. But for Lunaro, we had to try something else. So we tried a hybrid solution. Uh, and basically the, 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 the question that we try to ask here is, so if you ask for a ball, uh, if you tell the server to, to, <coughs> to throw a ball at the moment of release, it arrives too late. So uh, maybe we should ask in advance and line it up so that it will, it will arrive on my side exactly or roughly around the moment of release. And this is a function basically of, of your round trip time and the time that you have from the, in the animation, right? How much time do you have until that, that moment? And you can control the second factor. So in the, if you really want to push it, you could always make like a super slow animation, make it like two seconds long, which, you know, it's, it's obviously won't work that well because it will not be responsive at all. And the other problem is you also need to predict as a client you have to know your future hand position because you need to tell the host, hey, create a ball at this position. So the longer you make this, this uh, period between the animation start or the, the request moment and the release moment, is it, it affects your, your prediction horizon. And you know, uh, a second is enough for a guy to do, one, uh, to do full 180, in which case your prediction will be completely wrong. So we, we basically we cover like I think up to 100 milliseconds, maybe 150. And it's not even time to the release event because we also add a little buffer at the very beginning so it doesn't look, uh, so you don't throw the ball for, for remote clients. It doesn't look like you threw the ball without even playing the animation. It's still, it's, it's perfect or as close to perfect as you can get with little lag for the instigator, the guy throwing. It will be a little off for everyone else. It might seem premature. But the truth is, they don't really care about you as much. You're s smaller on their screen, and they're mostly looking at their character. So it's important uh, for a guy throwing a ball to look uh, the best it can. And that's how it looks like with same scenario, basically. 200 millisecond lag, 20 millisecond jitter. So if you, again, if you watch it frame by frame, it's, it's really, it's, it's not perfect. But in real time, I think it's pretty good. Consider this like a 220, up to 220 millisecond lag, and we only cover like 150 of that. So there's still some lag on top, on top of, of even after applying that solution. So the takeaways here is, as uh, with the talk uh, that, that was here before, apparently there's no silver bullets anywhere, no silver bullet here either. Perfect prediction will be the closest if you're going to somehow have a <coughs> and sometimes it happens, uh, but the risk here, basically we try to cheat and get away with it, right? So the question is, what happens if I get caught? The, but all those problems have their own, uh, all those solutions have their own problems. We can exploit some of the, some of the traits of, of uh, human mind, though, because we are, humans are selfish, basically. We're, we're much more concerned with ourselves. I have never seen anyone complain, I shouldn't have killed that guy, or, oh, no, it wasn't a headshot. That just doesn't happen. Uh, so that's what the Overwatch guys call favorite shooter. So try to, to within reason, 
to for the guy doing a cool action to, to reward it. The problem in PvP is there is always a human on the receiving end, and if he thinks it was unfair, he's, he is going to the forums. Uh, and that's for example, the, the, the eternal problem of being hit around the corners, right? Which, which is the same thing, basically. There's two clients with a very different views of realities, and they are both technically correct in their own world, but server has to pick one, and one of the, one of the players will, will feel cheated. Luckily for us, in Warframe in particular, big chunk of Warframe is PvE and NPCs don't complain. So we can extend this to favor the human. Uh, within reason, again, you don't want to feel the player to, 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 to be too obvious that, you know, everything he can, even if he's playing with like, like a two-second lag, uh, it all feels super easy. Uh, and it's always a choice between responsiveness and correctness, right? Full, fully, like, host authoritative solution is 100% correct but it's not fun to play. And then full prediction is, is, is completely responsive, but you pay the price if you mispredict. And I think games will probably move towards the prediction. They are getting a little bit more gutsy already. Like the, the again, the Overwatch guys are the trailblazers here. They predict uh, many things that, that games didn't use to predict. Uh, because it really, it's not so hard, right, to predict the future if your prediction horizon is 100 to 200 milliseconds. I could be like a really good fortune teller if people were happy with, with that prediction horizon. The paradox here, obviously, if, if, you, if, your lag is, if you're not really lagging that much, you don't need the prediction. And if you're lagging heavily, then prediction uh, becomes more difficult. So changing subject again. A little bit about multi-threading. So the replication engine originally was completely, for Darkness 2, was completely single-threaded. Uh, and we could get away with it because it was an order of magnitude smaller. We only had four players. And the third reason, unofficial, was I really didn't want to do it on the SPU. And the in April 2013, Sony contacted us asking whether, hey, would you guys like to make Warframe a PS4 launch title, and we're, you know, sure. The problem is now we had five or six months to port it to PS4, and it was quickly pretty obvious that, you know, single thread was not going to cut it, because we had now thousands of objects, up to eight players. Uh, I think it would cost like half a millisecond for one client, so with seven clients, that's, you know, almost four milliseconds lost for the poor host. So the traditional approach here, we obviously had a job system like everyone. Uh, this problem is technically like what people sometimes call embarrassingly parallel. You have a whole bunch of objects and you need to process them. So you just, you know, split them in little chunks of, of N objects and you kick them off to your job system and, and, and you're done, right? Well, it probably works. I haven't tried it. I gave it some, I gave it much thought though, because the problem is so now it's it's nice because you have control over granularity. You can uh, you know more objects, jobs that take longer, less objects they get a little bit less. Uh, so load balancing is great. The problem is there's an awful lot of what I call cross uh, uh, crossing the streams, which is basically every job or every worker, to be more specific, can read and write from structures of any client, right? So you basically you do all this all the time. Like try to this guy reads from this guy, this guy reads writes to this guy. And as this classic computer science movie teaches us, uh, crossing the streams is, is never good. So you could obviously slap like the put a lock on your structures and probably kiss goodbye most of your gains, or be smart, try some you know lock free approaches or whatever, which is false advertising a little bit. But if I learned anything during my years in the industry is I'm extremely cautious of super smart solutions because in my experience, smartness has a very limited number of bits. Even if you push it too far, it just wraps around and bites you somewhere where it hurts. And we only had one chance basically to get, to get it right. As I said, we had like five months or whatever. So I couldn't justify wasting weeks of time going up a blind alley just to discover that now we have to chase data races or it's not really a win. So I tried something easier. So in this approach, basically every job 
processes all objects that belong to a single client. So the nice thing about this is all jobs are completely autonomous. They don't need to touch each other's memory at all. They have everything they need. They don't there's no locks, not before it's like lock free or whatever, but really there's just no locks. There's no need to guard anything. The only point of contention was actually was memory manager, but if you pre-allocate your work buffers, uh, then that's gone as well. The problem here is jobs are a, li a little bit farther. Well, it's like I said, so it will be half a millisecond, which is fairly uh, significant for, for a single job. So obviously that they don't balance that nicely. But we have other jobs to fill the bubbles, right? Like not not uh, network related that are much shorter. So hopefully there won't be too many. And even if it doesn't get us like you know 100% workload, uh, it was much much easier to implement, and we didn't have to worry about many of these problems that I mentioned. It is a little bit more complex that I'm trying to to say, I guess, because this is the the, the big picture view. So we have like four workers, three clients, and it's kind of like a tree structure for these jobs. We have a parent job or a root job uh, in worker one that does some setup first and it actually spawns at traditional jobs, let's say, for the dirty mass calculations, which just operate on objects. So these are still the same like small jobs that take, you know, five objects and they they update their masks. But these are again self-sufficient. They only need to read and write from uh, uh, from this individual object. So no need for lock to lock anything. And it does the other stuff that I talked about, right? Calculate priorities, sort the objects by priorities for all clients, and when it's ready to kick off the job for the first client, uh, client we need to flash at this point because the the dirty masks have to be ready. So we do that. We kick off the first job. We do set up for the remaining clients, and then eventually the the root might even grab one of the the replication job himself. Uh, and that actually worked out really well, I feel. This was probably the first time that I ported a fairly complex system to a multi-threaded environment and it didn't backfire in a very spectacular way. Uh, it pretty much worked. There were some small issues, but it was mostly because I did something stupid, not because of the limitation of the system. So I feel it was a, it was a win. We had some other, like, <laughs> that was the ver first version, then we had some other passes trying to squeeze in, like, the last uh, bits of performance. So, congestion control. <coughs> Warframe uses UDP. I will start with that. I will not go into the whole debate, UDP versus TCP. Uh, we use UDP. And what's important in this case, specifically, is UDP has no congestion control, which basically means if you think of your connection as a pipe, right, with certain radius, maybe, that affects your bandwidth and some length that, that affects your, your latency. And now we try to stuff something in this pipe, maybe water or whatever. If you put too much, it will just overflow, right? And that's kind of what happens with, with, with networks. Your router will probably try to buffer some of the packets if you cannot keep up, but eventually they will just start dropping. So the, the, the challenge here is basically to how to find your limits and maintain them. So the first idea was basically, you know, uh, let's just reuse this one bit of, of TCP without the remaining overhead. Sounds easy. Uh, the first problem is there's not one approach, right? There's really dozens or maybe more. Like if you Google TCP congestion control algorithms, you will get hundreds of hits. Uh, in the notes, there is like one PDF, that PDF that's a decent summary. Uh, the good news is they are all very well documented. There's like RFCs, there is research documents, there's complete source code for every for everyone. I I usually just go to so go to a Linux kernel uh, repository. It has like a whole bunch of them implemented, right? So we can just you know pick and choose. But uh, they are still didn't really. It wasn't really directly applicable. Mo many of them are are fairly old. They're from like early 80s before Wi-Fi was a thing. So they wouldn't even take. Uh, uh, latency into account, it would just care about packet loss. And they just have different needs, basically. They're optimized for stuff like file transfer, you know, HTTP. They rely on, tra on traffic, underlying protocol actually being reliable. It's, if you read the research papers, it's, it's okay if it takes like three minutes to establish your limits, which for game, you know, you cannot be dropping packets for three minutes. 
uh, they need to be very generic, right? They have all the limitations that come with them being in, uh, implemented at the operating system level. Uh, like, basically, they operate on packets. They, you, you try to send a packet, and now the, the, the system needs to decide whether it, it can do it or not, and that it can buffer it or not, and that's pretty much all it has. But for a game, if you implement it correctly, you can actually, uh, this is, this is less important. The more important part, you can tell the game to just back off, right? Start sending things less frequently or, or uh, send less objects. And that's, that helps because otherwise you will just never catch up or you'll catch up too late. Uh, and the, the last thing is, as a game, you kind of get a, a license. You get a license to be a little bit of a jerk. Like you're playing my game and you're streaming a movie. I don't really care all that much if your movie stutters. But if the same thing is implemented on the operating system level, obviously, now you have to be a good citizen and, and have all those uh, different applications work together. So, uh, as I said, we realized TCP approach wouldn't really, wasn't going to cut it. It still gave us some ideas or validated some of the ideas that we had, uh, like BIC, uh, that's one of the algorithms. It uses the binary search to find your limit, which seems very natural, right? You're given a range trying to find a point in this range, so you know you, you you just binary search it. So our our search space is much smaller. It's I don't even remember if these numbers are correct. They're roughly roughly correct. I haven't looked at them in a while, but the high range is like we we never get there. This is mostly for the initial spike. But if you're generating 80 kilobytes per second while playing a game, you're probably having problems. So this is more like oh, if if you can afford that much during the initial spike. Uh, then you will load faster, but games should never get that high. And the majority of logic is in the replication layer because, as I said, it has more information. The more, most importantly, it can actually back off and gen start generating less data. Uh, so it's, it's very application specific, right? We try to leverage that uh, advantage that we can only we only care about our game. It's it's it probably has like 30 to 40 parameters, but you only have to set them once, and they are you know fairly obvious, like how much packet loss uh, do you still consider to be playable and stuff like that. And we obviously use both round trip time and 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 packet loss as connection quality metric because many many connections these days they will not start dropping packets immediately. They you will just see like uh, lag spikes, but they will get there eventually. So we usually start fairly high. And then we only decrease it if you cannot handle this much, and we only increase it if we absolutely need it. So the hope here is basically we don't have to touch it. And that happens fairly frequently. If you, if you have a decent connection and we never generate more data than this, this starting point, then that's it. Uh, the tricky part, I guess, is to distinguish between, as a host, whether you, uh, you're having problems because you cannot send uh, as much data because of your limitations, or if it's one of the clients that cannot accept that much data, which is much less frequent because for one thing clients only get data from one source and the other thing is mo uh, many connections these days are asymmetric so more down than up and uh, so we basically have two maxima uh, which is like theoretical maximum and current and we only uh, theoretical maximum is basically how far the current can go how high the current can go and we only try to bump this current maximum if you absolutely have to, because otherwise there's no point, right? If you generate game needs to generate more data, or send more data than this current maximum, we'll try to probe it, give it a little bit more and see. But it, again, you have to actually be able to generate that much traffic, because if you are not, there's no way to verify it, right? So we, we do it fairly rarely. And then there's the throttling I mentioned before, which is an important, uh, element of the whole system, right? So we basically start sending properties less frequently, uh, and we send less objects. Uh, hopefully, the more important objects go first. OK, the last part. So as I mentioned, Warframe is primarily peer-to-peer. -to -peer, uh, but in October 2016, we, we introduced dedicated servers. Dedicated server is basically a version of your game, ideally stripped of all clients' code, right? It basically holds the game. It doesn't, it's a headless application, uh, doesn't really require GPU. Uh, it, it sits there and basically hosts games uh, for eternity. And we had a very good starting point. Uh, 
wasn't my code, so I'm not patting myself in the, the back here, but I was really grateful that it was the case because our game and engine code it was already split into two layers. So basically in peer-to-peer -peer host and single player, you run both. If you're a client, you only run client layer. And so we didn't need like custom binaries or anything like that. It was basically just a matter of running the game binary with extra arguments, which is, you know, saved us lots of time. If you've seen the GDC 2017, I think Rainbow Six Siege presentation about dedicated servers, they had to comment out like 300, uh, 3,000 by uh, fragments of code to strip clients' uh, bits and then build a different binary. So if we had to do it, we just wouldn't have dedicated servers because we wouldn't have the manpower to do stuff like that. But luckily we had this one, which didn't really mean that it worked out of the box, sadly, because uh, both Darkness 2 and Warframe were peer-to-peer, -peer, so we didn't, tr there was like some basic tests, but that was it. So there were many places in a code when people would introduce non-obvious bugs by basically anytime you modified a network property from a client code, now that layer wouldn't run on the host uh, because the dedicated server doesn't have a client layer, so this property doesn't change. And sometimes it's fairly obvious if it's like a position maybe, but then there's cases like it will be something like, oh, you deal a little bit less damage on the dedicated servers, right? Sometimes. So we really wanted to 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 promote it from being something that you kind of have to play the game and be super uh, careful about to an obvious crash. So I added a dedicated server validation mode. That's basically just a flag. And every time you try to modify it, it's those Tina trappers in a client code, it just crashes. If this mode is activated, well, it will assert if this mode is activated. So now you can just play the game in a single player. You still have to play the game and, you know, uh, try all the different code paths, but at least it's no longer something you have to look for, it just, it will be super obvious. So now our QA, and the, 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 the nice thing is that it's still just PvP, so it's a small subset of a game and it was, we could manage. Uh, we had to exclude, obviously, your local guy and, uh, you know, guy, uh, avatar you control and, and uh, entities you control because that would completely invalidate prediction. The whole idea of prediction is to change uh, your network properties from a client code. And that's how it, you know, that's that's the dedicated server in all its glory, basically a simple command line application that just sits there now and waits for connections. It actually, it runs under Linux if you use Wine. Uh, so that's one other think we didn't really expect, but it turned out to work fine. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, you'd like to work on something similar, you can go visit this site or uh, talk to me. And I guess we still, there's some extra slides later if you download the presentation, but for now, I guess we can go to questions. Apart from uh, sequencing the data that you send in different ways, what's your most, uh, what's the, m what part of uh, data compression code are you most proud of? Because you said you, you have like uh, 150 objects in the high priority layer, and how do you deal with s such an amount of data? How do you compress it? Uh, well, to be honest, uh, we, made it easy for ourselves. There is it, there's one of the, I can actually go there just quickly. So there is extra slide on compression and the short answer is we used Oodle, which is like a third party library for compression. And it's really, it's really impressive to be honest because you know, packets are tiny still, right? It's, it's really hard problem to compress, uh, you know, 150 bytes. And they, it's, it's well, I think it's the best uh, solution right now on the market. Uh, we, before that we had some, there's like, whatever adventures we had before, but it wasn't nowhere close. We, had, we, did, we did the obvious things, right? All the, you know, bit compression and stuff, uh, zigzag encoding for integers and whatever, but uh, nothing comes close to it. <laughs> Last question. When uh, coding the 
multi-threaded fashion, I mean, when you were porting from the single to multi-threads, you said that you were able to avoid most of the points of... Um, you were able to avoid intertwining the threads. But how did you manage to actually uh, handle the player's interactions? Because uh, if there is a worker for every player, what happens when a player tackles another player? Oh, this was all done. So uh, basically, the network layer operates on its own structures. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's a very. We have a very clean separation of modules in our engine. So the the gameplay it feeds the network layer, right? Kind of. Uh, and then the the network layer operates on on its own independent data. And we also the the network the the replication runs after after simulation for the frame because we, we want to have the most up-to-date results. So they don't run at the same time too. So even if there is some uh, interaction, it's, it's safe. At this point, it's mostly, I think the, the, the replication overlaps with like UI, rendering, flash, stuff like that. It doesn't really inter uh, overlap with gameplay all that much. Great, thank you very much. Great applause. <laughs> uh.